Passport Adventures, where every week I'll be your tour guide as we explore countries around the world from the comforts of home. And where are we going this week? This week we're headed to Australia. There it is. Australia's origin story is very similar to the United States. About 60,000 years ago, natives called Aborigines were the only inhabitants of this island. Dutch explorers from Holland landed there in 1606, right about the same time Europeans were founding Jamestown and the Pilgrims were landing at Plymouth Rock. These explorers named this island New Holland. We don't go far for names. New York, New Jersey, uh, you get it. The British settled it as a colony in 1788, but it still wasn't a country. In 1824, it finally became Australia, and that name translates to unknown southern land. There was a lot that was unknown about this southern land back then. Like America, it's grown as a nation of immigrants. There are over 200 languages and dialects spoken in Australia, including 45 just from the Aboriginal people. One of the many special things about Australia is that it is an island, a piece of land completely surrounded by water, a country, and a continent. There are only seven continents in our whole planet, and one of them is the island country of Australia. More than two-thirds of it is covered in desert, so people mostly live on the coast. It is a land of opposites. Oh, and it's a really long flight. Better pack my itinerary. We're headed off. Hope you're ready. landed in Sydney, the biggest city in Australia. Let me get my itinerary out. Yes, Sydney, home of the Sydney Opera House. It took 10,000 construction workers 14 years to build this. From there, we head to Melbourne, the second biggest city in Australia. One important thing you might notice is these two cities are both right on the water. 80% of Australians live within 50 miles of the coast. Not everyone lives in big cities, though. There are plenty of towns in Australia. This one looks pretty much like our town, doesn't it? And then, of course, there's the suburbs with houses that look a lot like ours. But that's where the similarity ends. Australia is also home to giant rainforests. I, I mean, look at that waterfall. But as I said, Australia is a land of opposites. So while there are cities and suburbs and rainforests, most of Australia is covered in desert, what they call the outback. It's not as densely populated, but people do live here, which is why you might see a sign like this. <laughs> there it is. Kangaroo Crossing. <laughs> now these outback homes aren't as close together. In fact, sometimes your nearest neighbor could be miles and miles away. So you might not have a lot of friends to play with, but there'll certainly be a lot of wildlife. The good old kangaroo, one of the many symbols of Australia. There's also, let me get out of your way, the koala bear, the duck-billed platypus, which is a mammal that lays eggs and is also venomous. And this adorable guy down here is the pig-nosed turtle. Oh, I love this guy. This is the bilby. Doesn't he look like somebody put a disguise on a cute mouse? Oh, Australia is home to a place 
called the Great Barrier Reef. It is the biggest reef, coral reef, in the whole world, and it's home to 1,500 different species of fish, and this is one of them. Um, he's called the Blobfish. Not a very friendly name, is it? But he does pretty much look like a blob. And this guy's the Quokka. Every picture I've ever seen of him, he always looks like he has a great big smile on his face. Another animal is the Yoda bat. Can you imagine getting to name a recently discovered creature and you name it after your favorite Star Wars character? The thorny dragon. He's also called the thorny devil. This guy eats thousands of insects every day and he has a really cool trick to help him survive. Let's see. See where his head is? Right behind his head is a big lump of scaly skin. And when a predator comes by, not only does he have all of these thorns, but he can also duck his head in, and that bit of skin takes the place of his head into a predator. That's what it looks like. So when the predator is trying to go for his throat, they just get a big mouthful of scales. Oh, this is the witchetty grub. The witchetty grub uh, is an excellent source of protein. Yeah, protein, like as in food. They eat the witchetty grub, and thank goodness, because the witchetty grub made it possible for all of those native people to live for thousands of years before there was any settlements in Australia. The Aboriginal people were once the only population in Australia. Now, they're only 3%. They may not be a lot in numbers, but they still have a very vital, diverse group with rich cultures, and they still thrive today. One of their traditions is dot painting. Now, if you think about it, um, not just as something to do for art to be pretty to hang on the wall, but actually a way to communicate. Much like our cave paintings that have been found around the world, uh, the native peoples of Australia use these dot paintings in the same way, whether as a map to locate food sources or water holes, or to symbolize the animals that they find in their habitat. One of the aspects of the this dot painting that you can see on the picture of the lizard is that it looks like it's a taken from overhead. And that's how all of these dot pictures are supposed to look, as if the person doing the illustrating is looking straight down. Hey, here's some Aussie kids playing on the playground. If you met them and went to introduce yourself, you would probably say hello or a simple good day, mate. There isn't as much of a language barrier. Uh, these kids, if they were your age, um, let's see, it's most likely their names would be something like Oliver and Charlotte. I bet you know some Oliver and Charlotte's in your class. Well, there are over 200 languages. The majority of people that speak one of those languages also speak English. So language shouldn't be too much of a problem for us. But there are some funny sayings. I found these out when I was researching Australia, and I really thought they were fun to use. Here's one. A dog's breakfast. Now when I think of dog's breakfast, I'm thinking of a bowl of dog food. Why would they talk about a dog's breakfast? Well, a dog's breakfast is when you make a mess of something. Like, oh, a lot of times when I'm doing a cooking demonstration for you boys and girls, and <laughs> stuff gets everywhere or I forget an ingredient, I can really make a dog's breakfast of that. Another one is wrap your laughing gear around that. Well, wrap your laughing gear around that. What does that mean? Well, what do you laugh with? Your mouth. And if you're wrapping your laughing gear around something, you're going to take a big bite, maybe a big juicy hamburger they've just served you when they say, Wrap your laughing gear around that. I will. And the last one I want to tell you about is the way that they say goodbye. They say, we're going to hit the frog and toad. They're not going to start a fight with Kermit. 
It's just a saying, like we say, oh, time to hit the road. They say, time to hit the frog and toad. So, now that we know some sayings and we know how to say good day, we might introduce ourselves to these kids. And they probably ask us what our plans were for Australia Day. You see, Australia Day is coming right up, January 26th. And they celebrate it much the same way we celebrate the 4th of July. Now, because of the way the Earth tilts and goes around the sun, the way that makes our seasons, while it's winter here, in Australia, it's summer. So it's all about beaches and barbecues. It's a day they celebrate all things Australian. They take it very seriously in a very unserious way. They play lots of games. Um, one game is thong toss. Thongs are what we call flip-flops. And they toss them sometimes to see who can throw the farthest or who can be the most accurate. Kids and grown-ups play that game. There's the chocolate game. That's where uh, kids get together around a table and they try to eat a bar of chocolate, but there's lots of obstacles they have to go through first. Then there's the special Australia Day cookie challenge. That's when kids take a round cookie and see who can bite it into the shape of Australia. Whoever's closest wins. In addition to games, there's lots of other things to celebrate and there's lots of celebration food to be eaten. They have fairy bread, which is uh, like toast with sprinkles just crushed into it. There's their national dirt, 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 dessert pavlova, which is this delicious, crunchy, chewy meringue with fruit on top. But it's not just about sweets. They also have sausages, like we would have hot dogs at our barbecue. They have meat pies and shrimp on the barbie and damper bread. Then they finish the whole day off with a great big display of fireworks. Awesome. Wow, <laughs> this has been quite a trip. I, I think we're about ready to go. Well, let's hit the frog and toad. As they say in Australia, say you later, mate. back home. I want to do a few things to remind me of my trip though. So in your bag I've packed a few things to help us remember. First, I gave you a recipe for traditional damper bread. Then you'll find the pieces to make a duckbill platypus bookmark. And finally, there's a brown piece of paper, some cups of paint, and some Q-tips, because we are going to try to do some of that Aboriginal art. Let me guide you through it. All right, so for this part, you need a pencil and your brown piece of paper. I thought we could do a turtle from the top, maybe one of those pig nose turtles they have down there. So the first thing we want to do before we start dot painting is to draw some shapes. So we'll make an oval for the turtle's body. Then we need to make four rounded limbs. What else does a turtle have? Remember, we're looking from the top, so we're not watching uh, a turtle walk by. We're looking down on it from the top. So we can have some shapes like that. So we have a head, four legs, a tail, and the back. Now we can get our paints out. I 
And unlike a regular painting where we might just fill the whole thing in as if we're coloring, on this we just want to outline with dots. So first I'm going to take red and I'm going to just go along the outline of all the legs. You can choose whatever colors you want to do yours in. Uh, it's fun to do bright colors for this. If you look at the pictures of their art, the Aboriginal art, even though they had to use all the, the colors they used were from plants and things they found around, they sure managed to find some really cool colors. Then I'm going to dip in green and outline his shell. I think I'll do his head and his tail in green too. All right, now they don't fill it in. They're going to use that same dot technique, but with different colors. So now I might take yellow and go around and around in a circle. Actually, it's an oval. Then I might take the red just to mix my colors a bit. And then I might take some blue. And you can feel free to mix. If you want a new color, you've got the primary colors there. You can mix and make some secondary colors. And going back to the red. And back to the green. Now, also in their pictures, besides the animal, they would do symbols. And one of uh, the most important symbols that you'll find all over this kind of art is a circle. Because the circle represented the sun. It could help give direction to where something is. or say how many days something took. And you can do that on all the different parts of your paper and you have done an Aboriginal dot painting. I wish my friends were with me right now because I think having a contest to see who could bite a cookie into the shape of Australia could be a lot of fun. I'll have to play solo this time. Here's a map, an outline of the shape of Australia. Let's see how close I can get. <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, I'll put it on, I'll put it on. Oh, mm -hmm. Well, that's given me the energy to try the next game, which is Thong Toss. Okay, it's time for Thong Toss. We call them flip-flops, they call them thongs. They say it's easiest to play with kid-sized flip-flops, so we have some small child-sized flip-flops to play with today. Usually they play this outside at the beach, so uh, they go for distance. Right? They're going to throw it as far as they can, who can throw it the farthest. But they also play for accuracy. And since I'm inside due to weather today, I'm going to go for the accuracy round. All right, we've set up a box here so that you can see what it is I'm aiming for. And let's see, I've got two chances. Fingers crossed. I'm going to try underhand first. Oh, too short. Well, let me throw a little bit harder and higher. Right by, oh, right into my kitchen. <laughs> I think it's time to give someone else a try. All right, hey guys, now it is my turn. 
I am going to try the frisbee approach. Uh, Mary Ann tried the underhand. I'm going to try the frisbee, see if I'm a little more accurate that way. So let's try it. have a lot of fun uh, with those games and I hope you have a sibling or a friend around to give you a really good challenge because it was really fun to get a chance to play the game with Shane. Now, where are we headed next week? Mm, you're going to have to tune in next week to find out. Remember to come pick your packets up at the children's door of the library. Also, if you haven't signed up yet, just give us a call here in the children's room and we'll get you signed up. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to hit the frog and toad and see if I can turn some cookies into the shape of Australia.